show on Fox. So in a late start. Oh yeah, it's nine oh five. She gonna be quick. Well. Welcome to the Tammy Mac Late Show on Fox Soul. I'm Tammy Mac. And listen, defunding the police and abolishing the police are terms that have been dominating the conversations for weeks, right? But is it absolutely necessary to abolish the police system as a whole? And what would that look like for this country and the black community? Or is the solution to maybe place more black and brown officers in communities that they mirror? And what happens to police officers and members of the military who are forced to put their badge before the people? We're asking those questions and more today on the Tammy Mac Late Show as we talk to two former LAPD officers, Los Angeles Police Department officers, for those of you who don't know what that means. Uh, please welcome to the show Al Moreno and Brian Bentley. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hello, Tammy. How are you? I'm doing just fine. First off, I'm just going to start off by saying, um, is it a bad thing to be a police officer? Not in this climate. I mean, period. Is that a good career to choose? Well, I, you know, Brian, if I, you know, I, if I might start, I, you know, my, my uh, desire to become a Los Angeles police officer started in 1952 when I was diagnosed with late calvus perthes. I was crippled for four years, uh, crutches, a full brace like Forrest Gump. And um, uh, I recall the doctor at Children's Hospital in L.A. picked me up, put me on the examinating table. And he says, now, little man, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I looked at him in the face in a bumptious manner, just said, I want to be a policeman. Ever since then, I wanted to be a Los Angeles police officer. Uh, for me, uh, it was, um, it was uh, turbulent times as a police officer. Um, I had some very positive experiences, but I had a lot of negative experiences. And uh, I reported to the academy. It was on a Wednesday at 6 a.m. I'll never forget. And about 15 minutes later, I realized that I probably had made a mistake and that was going to be a long journey. I had a, a drill instructor who uh, approached me as I was standing in attention and looked at me in the mm -hmm. eyes and said, you know, we don't want people like you here. We have enough people like you in Nickerson Gardens, and we don't need them on the police department. And for those who don't know, Nickerson Gardens is a, is a project in uh, Los Angeles, a low-income project. And, uh, you know, at that point, I, I re quickly realized that maybe it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. But you still went through with it, Brian. I went through with it because at every turn, I was trying to prove someone wrong. Uh, even when I became a, uh, I graduated from the academy and I was a probationer, I was at West LA, my training officer told me that uh, his job was not to train me, it was to fire me. Ooh. Because, he, because he believed that all blacks and minorities were only on the job because of affirmative action and that he was not there to train me, he was there to fire me. And that was in, uh, that was in 1990. And West LA division was known for just being one of the worst in the most racist divisions in LAPD. I only worked West LA on loan a couple of times, like when you guys took your picnic, that sort of thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, after, you know, and when I went through the academy, it was only four months long, by the way. And the majority of the guys in, in my class were, were former uh, Vietnam veterans. And a lot of them guys had some college. And um, so it, it, listening to you just, you know, here just, you know, it just seems that our, our you know, experiences were um, pretty different uh, because that wasn't my, my experience at all. Although I did experience, um, uh, I applied for Los Angeles Police Department in 1970, uh, September the 17th, 1970, and it took me five years to get on the job. I was disqualified nine separate times. I hold a record for most disqualifications since 18. Why were you disqualified, Al? For, uh, they were all medical erroneous disqualifications. And I can go on and on and on and you know, so on do, about it. Do but you I, think I, those medical disqualifications really had to do with your nationality? Your exactly, your exactly, yeah, 100%. Uh, they weren't hiring a whole lot of people of color back in the early or mid 70s. Uh, there were a, a, a few, you know, there were some blacks and some Latins, but it was principally uh, a, a white department. And it certainly isn't that way now. 51% of the LAPD are people of color. So that's, that era is gone. 
But of course, I'm talking about, you know, 1970, 71, 2, 3, 4, 5, until I got onto the job. You know, it, it's interesting that, um, that you mentioned that because I got disqualified for having hair bumps, which delayed my entry into the academy for a whole year. I had to uh, see a specialist, a, a dermatologist, and I had to prove that I was able to shave every day. And all I had was two bumps. I had two bumps on my face when I went for my uh, physical and they disqualified me. And there's a whole lot of stories like that uh, wow. from officers who are disqualified for the smallest things. Well, I, I have my two best friends, Rick Beach and John Malai were on the job and uh, both did 20 years and they got on a couple of years before I did. And they were both white. And uh, Rick was disqualified for some nose anomaly and a, and a heart murmur, and it took him a little over two years to get on. John Malai was disqualified twice, uh, once for some hip problem and then something about a lung problem. And it seemed that everybody was talking, everybody that everybody was getting disqualified. There was one guy that got on, Dennis Rhodes, another guy that I went to high school with. By the way, I went to three high schools. Uh, but uh, uh, he's the only guy that I know of that uh, you know they got on the job straight away does that do something to you mentally when you are wanting to be a part of the force and then you get disqualified once twice nine times does it do something to you mentally and change your whole perspective once you get in does it make you a different police officer no um i uh, you know this this thing about uh, uh it is what it is and it was what it was back then and i wasn't going to have any i knew that i was going to be an outstanding police officer and i knew that all of these qualifications were a bunch of bullshit so i just kept uh uh going to these wonderful doctors and and applying and applying and applying i th and then when i finally got on um i i what i thought is that well you know hell let's just get him off We'll get him in the academy and, and, and you know, we'll drown him out in the academy. And uh, although that didn't happen, because I, I mentioned here earlier that I was, you know, I graduated uh, 18 out of 56. Yeah. So, um, and then once I got on, I, I went to Venice Division. Venice Division, somewhat like West LA, one of the slower divisions, although they had one area called the Oakwood area. It was principally uh, uh, Afro-American. And it was really, really quite active. And uh, so that particular car, I worked that car. And I also worked the beach car, which was a lot of fun, uh, Ocean Park Law. But um, uh, Venice, Venice Division was one of the quieter divisions in the cities, not, not as quiet as West LA, but uh, um, kind of an eclectic sort of place. Uh, the the uh, Venice canals were just honeycombed with people like the old, flower children. A lot of dope in that in that particular part of the division. So I, uh, Al, you have been in the military. You served in the military. Marine Corps. The Marine Corps. And I have a question relative to that because something has happened uh, virally um, in the way of the Dave Chappelle special. So comedian Dave Chappelle has a special and he talks about Christopher Dorden, I believe is, is his name, I'm sure. Uh, Warner, Christopher Dorden. He's, he's, he was your partner, Brian? No, he was not my uh, he was not my partner. But um, I did a lot of interviews after he went on his rampage because of some of the things that he wrote about in his manifesto. So let me make this clear to our listeners for for those that don't know. So Christopher Jordan is a LAPD who went on a rampage killing police officers, and ultimately, when they found him, they killed him. Dave Chappelle talked about this incident in his special. But what he said that I think a lot of people, um, that hit a lot of people really hard was that he was also in the military. He came out of the military and he got uh, to be a part of the police department, the LAPD. And um, when he went around killing police officers, Dave Chappelle suggested that a part of the reason he killed police officers was because he was trained in the military to kill terrorists and he thought that terrorists were police officers because he'd seen them kill so many people for no reason at all and had even tried to you know correct that behavior within the los angeles police department so I, i'm responding to al because you have also been in the military and do you think that is the mindset 
the, of the military killed the terrorists. If you see a group of people that are doing something, you would perceive them as terrorists. Do you think that is a reason why Christopher would have killed all of those police officers he did? Well, in, in Vietnam, we weren't fighting terrorists. We were fighting the North Vietnamese that wanted was an army and their brothers in the South, the Viet Cong. Um, so it wasn't like today, you know, it's, it's, it's principally you're fighting terrorists and they don't wear uniforms. But uh, I was up north in i and most of the firefights uh, that we got into with the North Vietnamese were uniformed army. Uh, so it, there was virtually no uh, terrorist sort of thing at all in, in my Vietnam experience. It was an army versus another army. And Brian, you're familiar with the case because it was around the time you were a police officer, right? So you were in well, contact with Chris, but we want to hold on to that thought and uh, talk about that when we come back on the Tammy Mac Late Show here on Fox Soul. There was a time in my life where I was extremely homesick. I decided that I needed a pet. When I first saw a turtle, my heart was full. He jumped up and kissed me and like jumped right into my arms. I immediately went up to the volunteers at the shelter and said, I want him, like, he's got to come home with me. Not anything but lonely. Every day with turtle is a perfect day and keeps me company when I'm doing schoolwork. I like it when he jumps up on the table, too. He is a veggie thief. He's an incredible companion and my best friend. I can't say that I've met anybody that doesn't love him, too. When I adopt a turtle, I discover all the things that make him unique. He's a little bit of a lot of things, but mostly he's all pure love. As we work to get through these times together, you may not be thinking about blood donation, but blood is needed to save the lives of people who are sick with a range of illnesses. It's easy and safe to give. If you are in good health, please donate. We need heroes now. Visit redcrossblood.org to schedule an appointment. Lake Show on Fox Soul. If you want to see more Fox Soul content, it's easy to do. Go to www.foxsoul.tv or you can download the Fox Soul app or you can watch us on Fox Now, Fire TV, Roku TV. Yes, we are on YouTube, Apple TV, Zumo, Tubi, and caffeine.tv as well. I'm joined today by former LAPD officers Brian Bentley and Al Moreno, and we're talking about uh, serving to protect the community. Do blue lives matter? Right now, um, we were talking about the officer, Chris Dorton, who went on the rampage killing police officers um, because Dave Chappelle brought him up in his special eight minutes and 46 seconds, which refers to the amount of time that George Floyd uh, was being, uh, you know, strangled to death, had, the officer had his knee on his neck. Uh, so Brian, you're well aware of who Chris is because you worked in the LAPD. You're familiar with the story. And are you familiar with Chris as well? I am. And one of the things uh, about the story that uh, really uh, hits me close is that he complained that um, he went to his superiors and complained about his training officer that had used excessive force. Yes. But one of the things about law enforcement that's unique to other professions is, uh, let's say in other jobs, if you go and you complain uh, to your superior about misconduct, 
you know, do an investigation. And if nothing comes of it, then uh, pretty much that investigation is over. But with law enforcement, if you go and complain about another police officer and you cannot prove that happened, then you get fired. You get fired for giving false information to a supervisor and for lying to a supervisor. Oh. So that's why police officers don't come out and complain about misconduct and what they see because they're unable to prove it. And with Christopher Dorner, he made a complaint and he had witnesses that said that his training officer used excessive force and they still fired him because they didn't believe him and they believed he was lying. So and when you so say police officers get fired for reporting other police officers, do you mean that in a secret society kind of way? Or is that something that's on paper, that's documented, that you can lose your job for doing this? It is documented and it's called giving false and misleading statements to a supervisor. Um, you cannot go and, um, you know, you're supposed to be held to a higher standard. So you cannot go to a supervisor and quote unquote lie on someone and uh, get away with it. That's the theory. So if you cannot prove it, uh, that that misconduct took place, then they see that as a lie. But you said that Chris Dorner had proof because he had witnesses that proved that that police officer, the training officer, uh, was being excessive. Uh, well, that, that is one of the reasons why he was so upset and he was so angry and went on that rampage. And I mean, we see it now with, with videotape and um, witnesses and police officers still aren't disciplined for what we see on video. So, you know, it, it goes both, it goes, it's the same way with officers on duty. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's hard to prove, you know, even if someone um, corroborates your story, even if there's tape, it's, it's still um, hard to prove that an officer commits misconduct. And so then if it's hard to prove, here we go, here we go, here we go. Mm -hmm. If it's hard for a police officer to prove that a police officer is being excessive or, or not serving and protecting, then it goes without say that it's hard for a civilian to say that a police officer did something wrong. Well, the hard is, is not even uh, a good description. It's almost like next to impossible. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as we, we saw in that case, and another thing that's interesting too, is when a civilian makes a complaint against a police officer, the first thing they do is they investigate the person who made the complaint. Uh, you know, they try to find out a reason why you complained on that officer. They research, uh, traffic tickets, arrest, uh, warrants, and they come up with all kinds of reasons as to why you made that complaint. You oh, okay. So now we're finding out something else here. Oh, 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 oh. So this is why when police officers shoot and kill people, uh, specifically black men or, or, or black women, this is why we end up getting a record of who they were. When, when you make a complaint against a police officer, you need to have your whole life in order. Ooh. You know, you can't just... Uh, I can't even have a baby out of wedlock. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, that's funny because police officers have a bunch of them. But um, <laughs> oh, and now, now, yeah. see, Brian, when you start talking like that, I think you're talking from bitterness and not truth. Now, mm, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to be able to separate the, the two. Yeah. Al, uh, talk to me. Is is this true? What Brian is saying? I, I you know, I disagree with Brian. Um, I was in two officer-involved shootings. Okay. And I know how comprehensive the investigation is. I mean, when you're done with it, you have two binders about this baby. We call them murder books, okay? And uh, what? When 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 we call them murder books. Murder. murder yeah, books. murder books. And uh, uh, we're also involved shooting, you know, investigations. But they're you know two or three stacks like this here, and it takes months and months and months, and it's it's extremely extremely comprehensive. Um, so the, the, the first shooting that I was in, uh, actually, I wasn't even out of the academy at the time. I was working in Wilshire Division, 7077, and we got a call at, uh, it was 4020 Pico Boulevard. I remember it. This was, uh, this was 1976 mm -hmm. or 75. Mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, uh, we rolled on the 211, and uh, it was a good 211. There were two suspects armed with 357 Magnums. And they and it was on Crenshaw and uh, um, what was the cross street? Crenshaw and La Brea, I think. It was a Colonel, Colonel Sanders restaurant, and uh, they had taken you know 
five hostages. And uh, again, to really condense the story, um, at uh, when we confirmed that it was a good 211 robbery, armed robbery, uh, we just coordinated everything, put everything on ice, and we got on the PA system, and it was our, our call. And we put an officer in his help call. So here comes the blue wave. Here comes the, uh, the air unit. And um, we uh, uh, told them, you know, ordered them to come out, drop their firearms, and come out. They didn't do it. So it qualified for a hostage, you know, situation. At that time, we called in, you know, Metro or SWAT and waited for them. That's their expertise. Well, this one suspect didn't wait and he came out the side door. Our car was just right next to where the side door was. I was maybe about four feet away from him because I was the right rear part of the car, uh, of the vehicle. My two other part was over the left front part of the car and there were other and waited for them. That's their expertise. Well, this one suspect didn't wait and he came out the side door. Our car was just right next to where the side door was. I was maybe about four feet away from him because I was the right rear part of the car, uh, uh, of the vehicle. My two other part was over the left front part of the car. The keys to your car. Well, obviously we were gonna give him the keys to the car. And uh, he had the 357 Magnum cocked. So I just took a bead on which would be the left side of his face and I was going to put a round right into right around where the eye is and just check him out straight away before he murdered that little sweetheart and just before I fired the round I was just squeezing it off so that it would be a true round because the little girl was too close one of the other officers fired um, the little girl wheeled around and tore away then many of the guys opened up on him and uh, and he was killed um, by the way, I didn't fire a single round, and I was closest to him because the first shotgun blast that he took, right. I knew he was dead. But he didn't go down, and he had the 357 Magnum locked in his hand, so that's why they continued to fire. And after the other, the other suspect gave up, but um, after the investigation, they separate all the officers. They take you to the station. You wait for the robbery homicide uh, a team that, that investigates also about shootings. They separate everybody. You're not to talk to anybody. And uh, after the, you know, six or seven hours of, you know, talking to you, then they, you get into your soft clothes, you go back out to where the shooting was and you walk through. And it's, it's absolutely. I understand. Okay. So I think we all can agree that perhaps that suspect deserved to be shot in the head. I think we can all agree with that, whether he was black, white, Hispanic. It doesn't make it, the color doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Doesn't matter. No. But I think what we really want to know is how does someone who's done absolutely nothing but maybe sell a, sell a cigarette or sell CDs or even happen to have a fraudulent $20 bill end up dead, but then someone like a Unabomber or a school shooter or uh, somebody who goes into the church and kills everybody, how do they end up alive? But these people with less, um, with less charges or less incident, less of an incident end up dead. And they just so happen to be black and the others so happen to be white. I think that's the answer everyone wants to know. Um, I mean, gonna... Can you be a little more specific about, because you, you, you mentioned several different, really critical sorts of situations, but if you can be really specific and ask some questions about a I'll particular do that. shooting. I will absolutely do that when we come back on the Tammy Mac Late Show on Fox Soul. George Floyd. His name was George Floyd. Say his name. Say his name. George Floyd. Say his name. Say their names. Once again and always, we fight for justice. Black Lives Matter. Go to blacklivesmatter.com.
there. <laughs> Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Why did the girl ask the mushroom to dance? Because he was a fun guy. <laughs> what do you call a pig that knows karate? Pork chop. <laughs> Why was the basketball court all wet? Why? Because a pair of cats dribbling all over it. <laughs> Can I tell you another one? Um, so, how does a tissue dance? Put a little boogie on it. What's Beethoven's favorite fruit? Banana. <laughs> Uh, what is a boxer's favorite drink? Fruit punch. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Welcome back to the Tammy Mac Late Show on Fox Soul. And so we have um, two former LAPD officers with us today, Al Moreno and Brian Bentley. And we are talking about the police. That you, both of you are also authors. So we are going to um, ask a little bit about your books in a second. But I want to get to the question that uh, we are going to get answered from both of these police officers. And that is, why is it that a white man can seem to get in the car or a white man who's accused of a crime can seem to get in the car and walk away and you know get a trial, get go to jail, and and be allowed all the liberties uh, of an American citizen. But when a black man is accused of a crime, he's shot dead. And I want to be specific for you, Al and Brian. Uh, Dylan Roof went into a church in South Carolina and prayed with a collective group of black members of that church before he shot and killed nine of them. And officers peacefully brought him in. It is alleged that they even stopped off and got him a burger at Burger King. And he's now in jail and not dead. However, we have someone like Michael Brown or George Floyd, who was alleged to have had a fraudulent $10 or $20 bill. And he ends up dead at the knee of a police officer. And these cases happen over and over again, um, where we see white men almost kill people and they get brought in, they get taken in. And black men who do less crimes get killed. And so I'm asking um, Al and Brian, why does that seem to happen most often? Well, I'll address um, ahead, in my situation. Uh, I worked in South LA and um, we have a lot of great officers, but you have bad apples um, in this in South LA in the black community. That's where the bad apples are. That's where they go intentionally. I worked with a lot of officers that were very aggressive, um, addicted to the violence, addicted to the violence. Um, they loved it. Uh, their mantra was that they were hunters of men and that they went out and they sought that type of violence every day and, and every night. Um, you know, they're addicted to the violence in the way that uh, people are addicted to cigarettes and alcohol. They can't help it. I mean, we see people now, uh, officers have body cameras on, people have cell phones in their hands, you have uh, surveillance cameras on uh, businesses, and these officers still go out and they still commit misconduct and brutality because they cannot help it. So, Brian, it sounds like you're not saying that it's even a race situation. You're saying it's a blue situation. Well, I'll, I'll say it's not brown. You're like the officers, period. So it's not that white officers want to kill black men. It's that police officers want to kill people. That's well, what it sounds like you're saying. Well, you, you know, in a sense, that's it. And but to my point is that those who um, who have that addiction, who are violent, uh, are allowed to exercise that in the black community. They can't go in, in the white neighborhoods and do that. Um, but they can come into black community because they use the statistics of crime and they get away with it. That's their excuse. Well, I mean, is that crime. true? That they're in high crime right now? I'm it's, asking Al, is that oh. true? No, I, I radically disagree with uh, with Brian and I'm talking to you from my own personal experience. Of course. Uh, 
You're, you're, you're going to get into altercations with suspects that resist. You're going to screw up your uniform. You're going to get hurt. There's going to be an internal affairs investigation, and it's a lot of hell for nothing. The problem is, is that so many times now, so much of the public has been habituated to resist. I mean, when you get stopped by a policeman, he's going to give you a ticket, give me your, you know, your driver's license, proof of insurance, cooperate with them. If you disagree with him, uh, fine, you can take him to court. But it's gone to now where you make a police stop and, uh, or a traffic stop and you ask somebody in the course of your duty and right away you're getting challenged, you're just up in the ante straight away. And I don't, I don't if I knew of a policeman that was beating the hell out of somebody or had this propensity, I would roll him over and make your head spin. And I would not, I, I would do it and when I spoke to the whoever, the sergeants, and the rest of the officers that I worked with were the same mentality. So I'm just, I, 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 when I listen to Brian, I don't know if he's, if, what LAD, LAPD is talking about, because that wasn't my, my, my experience. And I'm not saying by any stretch of imagination that there aren't bad officers, not only in the Los Angeles Police Department, but in other police departments as well. But that's just totally, totally not the truth. I, 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 you know, you go to work, uh, th these people that are, uh, are that become officers have this mentality of that they want to help the community. They want a job that's exciting. They want a job that pays somewhat reasonably well. And uh, it, it's just uh, it's just not my experience at all. I, I you know I, and like I said, if I seen somebody doing something like that, I would drop a dime on them in a heartbeat. Well, Chris Dorner saw someone doing uh, doing that to people, and he reported it, and they fired him. Well, you know well, that was that was my donor. Believe me, he had a, a he had a, a really bad track record in the military, and he also had a really bad track record in the academy. And he also had a really bad track record with different officers. In fact, one of my one of my one of the one of the two officers that I mentored onto the LAPD. I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, he was on uh, Dorner's hit list, by the way. Um, and he was in, actually he was in Dorner's academy class, and everybody was trying to figure out. How the hell is this guy staying on the job? Because he was just screwing up one time after the other. And on top of that, I don't care what anybody says or does. Or if you don't like it, you get the hell out of there. Why stay? It's 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 just it's just insane. I don't I don't understand why once somebody would want to stay on a department and 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 you know would, would that what you know in his mind that kind of that kind of police officers I would. Well, Al, what, what always interests me is I do hear people say that there are bad apples in the police department. There are. Admitted. But I, I've never met a police officer who knows a bad apple. Oh, I, I knew a bunch of bad apples. I, I have their email and, and text numbers. Uh, you know, a lot of my partners were, were bad. And, uh, you know, I worked the... Um, so did you report them, Brian? No, I didn't report them. Um, a, lo a lot of it was, well, one of the things that I said too is that, uh, as I mentioned before, that if you do report it, you have to have concrete evidence. Otherwise, you become the victim. And secondly, um, as part of uh, being a police officer, your job is to stop your partner from being excessive. You know, emotions run high. Sometimes officers get uh, violent. Sometimes they act unprofessional. And as a, as a partner, your job is to reel them in. And so, so we have some of our soulmates who are commenting, so I want to let them weigh in. Ms. Shay Jim Dropper says, resisting arrest doesn't mean or doesn't warrant being killed. <clears throat> um, and she wants to know, Al, are you for Blue Lives Matter campaign? I'm for all Lives Matter campaign. Every human being is as precious as another human being, regardless of the color. Do you see that there is a systemic difference in the way uh, black people are treated when it comes to uh, the, the policing in America? I can talk from this personal officer's experience that how I treated black suspects, they got treated like white suspects, Hispanic suspects, and the officers that I worked with did the same thing. And if they didn't, I'd be on their ass. Mm. Interesting. Let's talk about defunding the police. That's been going around a lot. Do you believe, uh, in, a, in Los Angeles, as a matter of fact, 
uh, they are talking about utilizing professional services to handle nonviolent calls and removing that from the police's uh, responsibilities. I think they've done it in a couple of other cities as well. They've actually uh, made it happen. And I think Minnesota is one of, I mean, Minneapolis is one of those cities. Uh, so do you feel like defunding the police? Oh, San Francisco, uh, they've done it. Do you feel like that's a good idea? Do you believe it's a good idea to take some of those responsibilities away from police and particularly the nonviolent ones? Well, they're talking about $150 million from the budget of Los Angeles Police Department. And they're going to ferret out to, God, I don't know, who knows. But just prior to that uh, incident with Mr. Floyd, uh, Mayor Garcetti was actually asking for an increase. And the way I see it is that uh, defunding law enforcement is just going to take away from the monies that they're putting in to in-service training. Um, so, and the people that are going to suffer the most are the very people that need law enforcement the most. I think that it's absolutely insane of biblical proportions to defund law enforcement. Uh, and you're going to have anarchy like you have never, ever experienced. And no, hell no. Oh, wow. I, <laughs> the budget for the police in Los Angeles is $1.8 billion. Correct. Ryan, well, you know, do they need all that money? Yes. Well, you know, I, I totally did. I disagree with that. For one thing, we have not seen the proposal. So we don't know exactly what the mayor is, is proposing. Um, uh, we've seen the statistics in South LA and uh, minority communities go up every year. I don't think that um, crime such as gangs and so forth are a police issue. It's, it's a social economic issue. And I think uh, we need to experiment and get away from the type of policing that we have. And because you have a large number of police officers in uh, minority communities, doesn't mean that that's going to deter crime. And all police officers aren't there for the same reason. Um, I've worked with officers and the only reason that they're in the black community is so that they can have it on their resume because they want to promote and they want to move within the department and it looks good in their package if they worked in a busy division. So, I mean, I've worked with officers. First thing they say when they're in the car is, hey, look, I'm only here because I want to be here for two years and then I'm going to promote. Um, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved in pursuits. I don't want to uh, deal with gang members. I just want to do my time and get out of here. So just having a bunch of officers in the neighborhood, it, is, it doesn't mean that things are going to uh, turn out positive. Um, Al, a lot of our soulmates are, are kind of going at you here. So I want to put this in perspective for our soulmates who are listening. Al worked for the Los Angeles Police Department and actually said that he was treated unfairly and unfairly terminated. So Jill Williams says Al disagrees because he doesn't have the black police officer's narrative, period. But Al, you believe that you were fired unfairly from the LAPD. Well, I am a, a, a person of color and I don't have to be black to experience the sort of uh, 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 problems that some other person of, of color. Uh, the 90% of the uh, supervisors and officers that I work with on Los Angeles Police Department are the finest people in the world. However, I pissed off some uh, higher uh, echelon uh, folks and they went, uh, I blew the whistle on, the last four years I worked with the LAPD, I worked at LAPD's first ever gang suppression unit when it first started in 77, Operation Central Bureau Crash. We worked all of East LA and the northern part of South Central, which is Newton Division. The unit of 40 super cops were working against 450 gangs with 75,000 gang members. LA is the gang capital, acknowledged as the gang capital of the world. Our unit handled one to three shootings every single night for four years, up and to five. And it was the blacks blowing the hell out of the blacks, and it was Latinos blowing the shit out of each other. And that's been going on since the turn of the century. And day after day after day, when you see these children, six, seven, eight years old, a baby in a crib, senior citizens with their brains splattered all over the hell, and you don't want to, uh, you want to defund the, the, the police department and cut those numbers down in those areas that need law enforcement more than anybody else. That is absolutely insane. 
It's insane. Well, thank you for that. What I will say, what I will say about that is, it's interesting how big the budget for the the police departments are, and yet, and still, the gang members continue to grow, the crime continues to grow, and so I have to wonder and question where the hell is the budget really going? And I honestly don't believe that it's about training. I think it's about the heart. Because I don't care how much training in the world you have, if you are out to kill somebody, you are going to kill them no matter what your training says, no matter how grand it is, no matter how less it is. If you're out to kill a black man, you're going to kill him. If you feel like you're above and beyond reproach because you're a police officer, you're going to kill people. And if if I was working with an officer that said that he was or intimated something about one of my brothers, a black, uh, an Afro-American, I grew up with Afro-Americans and Latin kids. If I had some asshole in the car, uh, even elude that he was gonna go out and beat the hell out of a black person, I'd have taken him out of the car and gangster slapped the shit out of him right there. That, well, I, don't, I don't understand where this comes from because I'm talking about personal experience. And if anybody should be pissed off at the Los Angeles Police Department, it should be me because I got screwed on this uh, because I had blown the whistle on the on the on the units a uh, higher echelon uh, watering down the statistics about the true number of gang related crimes and the, and the and the police department or higher management went postal and fired me listen it's five and a half years I had accumulated over 71 commendations and I led the unit in gun seizures and it went on to say in my rating reports officer Marino recovers more firearms than anybody else in the unit who has avoided an officer involved shooting. On that note, uh, uh, Mr. Moreno, we'll be right back. It's Tammy McLeish okay. on Fox Soul. You're the engine that makes all things go. And you're always in disguise, my hero. I see your light in the dark. Smile in my face when we all know it's hard You're doing a good job, a good job You're doing a good job, don't get too down The world needs you now, know that you matter, matter. Bye Janet, it's nice seeing you nice again see you, you a good girl Just let me know what I can do to help Well to help me, she'd have to help every day. Every hour, every ouch, every time my wife calls for help. I mean, maybe she could help me make her lunch, but the crust, all the crust has to be cut off the corners. She could help me run to the doctor for the fifth time this week, help me with the specialist and the second opinions and the painful paperwork about paperwork, help me deal with how hard it is seeing my wife's name on so much paperwork but this is on me i'm the only one who can do this like this for her besides take care we will (laughs) janet doesn't like her cooking anyway find support for your strength visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community Anytime they're playing music downstairs, it's, it's loud. I go downstairs, see what they're doing, see what music they're doing, see what they're dancing to. I go play piano downstairs, they come get involved. Leah has a drum set beside it, banging that. Any music, uh, that's what they do. late show on Fox Soul. We're talking to two former LAPD officers. Los Angeles Police Department has gotten a real bad rap. They're probably uh, the most notorious uh, police gang that exists in America. Um, and so to talk to you two fellas is, uh, is, is nice to get a little peek behind the curtain. Um, Al, you really seem to have an affinity for uh, the organization that unfairly terminated you. And Brian, were you terminated or did you leave? Oh, I was fired. 
I was fired. In fact, they have the most allegations out of anybody in LAPD history. And they all stem from the book that I wrote one time, the story of a South Central Los Angeles police officer. When you um, say you have the most allegations, what does that mean? Oh, that means that um, I had over uh, about 360 allegations of misconduct that came uh, as a result of, uh, of the book that I wrote. Uh, because in the book, I described misconduct that I saw. I described things that, um, that happened um, to me and each one was an allegation of misconduct. For instance, I'll give you a quick example. I wrote in my uh, book that my training officer uh, told me that the only reason to have women on the job was so that they could have oral sex in between cars. So I wrote that and um, that was the allegation of misconduct because I didn't report it at the time. So that's the way um, the investigation went. I was interviewed for 14 hours straight. They went, it was like a book report. They went over every paragraph, every line that I wrote. So, so I just want to get this clear for some, for some of us who aren't familiar with police. Okay, because you, you're, you're, you mentioned writing a book. So let me, let me get this clear. You wrote a book and because you wrote the book, you had 360 allegations or you had 360 allegations and that helped to formulate a book that you've written. No, I, when I wrote the book, I wrote the book while I was still a police officer and I was in great standing. Um, you know, the department loved me. I could go and work any assignment I wanted to work. Um, but I had, uh, you know, this moment where I decided that I wanted to write about the things that I saw because when I spoke on it, you know, people didn't believe me. So I wanted something concrete that people can go back and uh, so reference. You wrote a book while you were a police officer. I wrote two books while I was a police officer. Ah, there and, it is. And so I would go on radio shows and talk about racism and about violence. Basically, my book is about the culture of violence in the police mm -hmm. department, how it's accepted and, um, and how, uh, you know, the department likes officers who are badass and those, you know, everybody wants to work with that type of person. So, you know, I wrote that. And um, because of that, uh, these allegations came up um, from that. But before I wrote the book, I didn't have any problems. I, you know, I, I was a, a... So it was the man. actual LAPD that pressed the allegations upon you, not civilians. No, I, it was not a civilian um, complaint. It was, it was actually by Bernard Parks. Bernard Parks is the one who initiated the oh my. complaint. Yeah. Bernard Parks, let everybody know who Bernard Parks is. In Bernard Parks was a, a black police chief, the first black, he was the second yeah. black police chief of And I believe now Los Angeles. as a politician in, in Los he, Angeles. He, he is, he's a, a politician. And uh, that brings to an interesting story because, you know, people think that if you have more black officers on the police department, that things will be better. Um, when I talk about West LA, um, and I talk about my training officer who uh, was racist, I went to my captain who was black and I went to my captain. I said, Hey, um, my training officer is racist. He made some racist remarks and he looked at me and said, I've been on the job 35 years. You don't think I know that? He, he said, well, it sounds like the police departments all across America need an enema. Well, I, I can't speak on all the other ones, but I know the people that I work with need a, uh, a definite uh, something. Um, so we're talking about you two being fired, but now in the wake of all of this protest that's happening, we're seeing police officers across the country resign due to lack of support and low morale. Is this a good thing or bad thing? Do we want those officers exterminated? Like, is, is, are the protests and the, the police reforms that are being made, is, is that the, the roach spray? that is exterminating those bad apples that we talk about. Uh, Tammy, uh, law enforcement from year to year, it's, it's kind of an evolution. Uh, there's constant new uh, training. There's uh, new uh, non-lethal weapons that are introduced. There are, uh, they're tightening up this and tightening up that. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that today, objectively speaking, uh, the, the, and again, I, you know, I was a Los Angeles police officer and I still have many officers that are friends. And, and of course the two that I mentored on their department, and I'm not sitting here to bullshit you or stick up for somebody or just generally, you know, stick up for the Los Angeles police department. I'm talking from the heart. I'm talking from an experience. I'm talking from, 
uh, uh, you know, a, a life, all my life, I wanted to be a police officer. Right. And I, I just, you know, I, I'm just, I really don't understand where Brian's coming from. You know, he made the statement just a second ago. He says, uh, on one hand, you know, they were all over his ass. And then on the other hand, uh, the department loved me. So what is it? I'm going to ask Brian that question. Brian, we do have some comments here for you. Our soulmates are saying you write a book but never report the injustice directly to the department or internal affairs. Um, and, and, and Pierre Jones, our soulmate, says you should be ashamed that you never reported your white officers, Brian. So well, I, I, just, I just mentioned to you when I was a uh, probationer, I went to my captain who was black, told him my training officer was racist and the comments that he made about him not wanting to train me that he was there to fire me because all blacks and minorities were on the job because of affirmative action. I went to my captain. He said, you don't think I know that? Um, he said, the mayor, who, who am I going to, he goes, who am I going to take this to? Am I going to take it to the chief because the chief is racist? Am I going to take it to the mayor because the mayor knows it and he ignores it? He said, get the hell out of my office. And he said, you know, don't, don't bring that shit in here. Are you talking about Mayor Bradley? Yeah. And so was that was finest, he was one of the finest human beings God ever created. He well, was black, you, uh, he was with the LAPD for 20 some years. Well, what about Daryl Gates? What about Daryl Gates? He, what about Daryl Gates? The mayor of Los Angeles, a fantastic mayor. And I might add that under, it was under, under Mayor Bradley, we had the worst LAPD in the history of, of, of crime. Exactly. What about Daryl Gates? Daryl Gates, he um, was okay with racism, he was okay with sexism. He never took a complaint and he didn't believe in firing people. You could do whatever you want to do. And all he would do is give you what they call freeway therapy. He send you to another division. But he didn't believe, he didn't take any racial complaints seriously, any sexual harassment complaints seriously. And um, uh, Mayor Bradley is the one who messed up and could not fire Gates when the riots took place. So, I mean, all this, this the, you talk about him being the finest, whatever. He was incompetent as a mayor when it came to dealing with with law enforcement. He couldn't for those do, of you he, who are not familiar with Daryl Gates, he was the police chief of Los Angeles uh, from 78 to 92, I believe it was. Something like that, yeah. And, and to, uh, to the callers who um, said that I should be ashamed of myself, there's no way that I could go to my superiors and complain that something would be done. Nothing was gonna be done. So any issue I had to, that I had with officers, I had to deal with it myself. And that's the way black officers have to deal with things. There, well, you Brian, cannot go to a superior. Hold on, I'm talking. You go cannot ahead. go to your superior and complain because the same thing that happened to Christopher Dorner would happen to those officers. So as a black officer, you have to start handling stuff yourself. You can't rely on the department to do it. You have to step up and you got to handle that complaint and deal with that issue yourself. Black officers deal with uh, all kinds of issues that the public doesn't know about. We, are not, we have our own little uh, war that we have against racism and against sexism on the department because the department will not solve it. Yeah. I, 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 I just, uh, you know, I, I'm just totally confused with, with Brian. Um, you know, on one hand, he, he's got so much corruption, he writes a book about the plethora uh, of corruption, yet he didn't report it. He didn't have the balls enough to report it. If I seen corruption, I would report it and come hell or high water. If that was the LAPD that, uh, that Brian experienced, I'd get the hell out of there. So I don't know where he's coming from. You don't know where I'm coming from. And um, I don't expect you to understand. I think, that is, I, I think that is, I think that is what we're here for. Yeah. Well, uh, Brian can't quite understand your experience, Al, and you probably will just admit it that you can't understand his. And that is the difference that we are trying um, to bridge in America today. The fact that two different ethnicities share completely different experiences under the same branch of government. And I think that that is what the conversation is all about. How is that possible? We're going to take a break and we'll be right back because I want to find out what Al's book is all about on the Tammy Mac Lake Show here on Fox Soul. We are tired of mourning. We are tired of suffering. And we are tired of waiting. Experts predict that the black female vote will be central to the 2020 presidential elections. The truth is in the numbers, but the voice is in you. 
Imagine if we use our collective voice to create a collective powerhouse. Black women have always been at the forefront of lifting our voices to vote. In this very moment, we can change the history of this nation. Let us not forget that we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. You see us, but now it's time for you to hear us. I'm Ivy Coco, your Miss Black California USA 2020. Queens are lifting our voices to vote. Join us and let's rise up. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. Hey, Dad, I need your help asking Jessica to prom. Of course. Love is like the ocean. You have to tread the Oh, waters. Dad, that's not the kind of help I needed. Hey, Jessica. I, um, will you go to prom with me? Yes. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care can't wait to share their first with you. Talking to two former LAPD officers on the Tammy Mac Late Show today. Brian Bentley uh, wrote a book about all of the infractions and injustices within the police department. What's the name of your book, Brian? Uh, the first book I wrote is called One Time, the story of a South Central Los Angeles police officer. The other book I wrote is called Honor Without Integrity. And Al has written a book himself. Is it about the police department, though? It's about the LAPD. I can't understand, Al, how you love this department so much that just completely doused you. It was a handful of upper management uh, dishonorable people that went postal when I blew the whistle on our lieutenant that was uh, underreporting the gang stats. So but then the, we the men and agree. women. We can agree that there are some dishonorable- Absolutely, 100%. But the great majority of, of, of every officer that I, I worked seven divisions in the time that I was in, all of Central Bureau and, 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 and two in West Bureau, Venice and Hollywood. And I, I, just, I, you know, I, I just can't tell you how, what a blessing Talk it was. Talk to me to, about to, your to book. What's, your, what's the name the, of it? The book's an intimate portrayal of how a kid from the ghetto uh, uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, that raised in a gang infested area, uh, uh, rested a few times as a teenager, uh, uh, struggled with his math. I had dyslexia, dyscalculia, but I didn't, I didn't take that low road of saying I'm screwed. Everybody's on my ass. I went to school. I went to college. I joined the Marine Corps and I got up to the standard where the Los Angeles Police Department hired me. I love that department for the exception of maybe 5% of the people who are powerful enough to get me the hell out of there. But it gives an intimate portrayal and of what our men and women in the uniform do for their community on a daily basis. Tell everybody the name of LA's the book. LA's Last Street Cup. LA, LA's, <laughs> LA's Last Street Cup. Last Street Cup. Listen, right. I think if we've learned nothing today, we have learned that it is very difficult for police officers to report those bad apples that they refer to so much. So I think uh, uh, when we are mad and angry at the police officers themselves, I think it's good to know that you guys really are reporting and either you're getting fired or um, nothing's happening because the police chiefs and the mayors are afraid to take on the system themselves. 
And so it looks like we have to go to a higher level when we choose who our police chiefs are, when we choose who our mayors are. That's what we have to look at when we talk about police reform. So think about that, soulmates, when you're uh, mad and angry at the police and you're thinking, well, yeah, they're bad apples, but the good apples are bad too because they won't report the bad apples. Look. Uh, thank you so much, Al. Thank you, Brian, for being on the Tammy McLeod Show. The conversation was absolutely delightful and informative and uh, made me a little angry all at the same time. <laughs> I thank you, Tammy. It was a lovely being on your station. Thank you so much. I, I will see you all tomorrow at 8 p.m. right here on Fox Soul. It's the Tammy McLeod Show. Until then, it's a blessing to be in your box. Bye.